Hello hackers. Welcome to another module in Pwn College. This is the beginning of the kernel module. Um, this module is going to be a very interesting experience. It's going to um, uh, take us into a different level of abstraction than where we've been operating until now. Um, hopefully you will uh, enjoy this ride. All right, what is a kernel? Um, I'm recording this uh, lecture uh, shortly before the 2020 um, United States general election. So I will use a US centric um, analogy. Apologies if you are um, watching this from outside of the country, but basically in a US centric view, you can imagine individual processes are um, basically individual states, right? And individual states manage their own affairs internally, et cetera, et cetera. But the federal government, which is the kernel, manages the state's interactions with each other and with external resources, other countries, and so forth. Um, that's a, a good analogy, right? And so what are these external resources that only the kernel has access to? Well, um, we have several um, uh, immediate examples we can use um, in computing a shared resource is basically your computer nowadays, right? Even if you don't share your computer with other people, the, the processes on your computer share the computer, the hardware with each other. Um, and then oftentimes, of course, um, if you are in a, on a server or whatever, you share that server with other people. Um, so let's look specifically at resource, at, at, at instructions. What are these, um, you know, uh, kernel, only um, very uh, sensitive instructions that, that need to be protected against um, just basically un unfettered use by individual processes. One such instruction is HALT. HALT shuts down, that should say, uh, CPU computation, just stops it, right? It doesn't actually turn off the system. Um, it just stops the CPU until there's more work to be done, but this is a instruction that really only um, the uh, manager of the hardware should be making, and that manager is the kernel. There are instructions for interacting directly with hardware peripherals. Two such instructions are in and out for input and output. Um, they are used to to uh, communicate with, um, you know, uh, like the little cards you plug into your uh, machine, among other um, interaction techniques that are also reserved for kernel use. And then um, there's actually a bunch of um, not only instructions, but also special uh, registers. For example, um, control register three, CR3, um, is a uh, uh, reference to the page table that is used to um, translate virtual addresses of your process into physical addresses um, in your actual RAM, right? And the RAM stick inside your computer. Um, you can read more about them on Wikipedia and it's a, uh, or, or many, many places around the internet. Um, but uh, it's a register that can just be accessed using move, believe it or not, but it can only be accessed in kernel mode. Um, because if you could control the CR3 register, you could uh, basically um, arbitrarily control your uh, uh, the memory mappings of your process, and then you could clobber system memory and do all sorts of bad stuff. Um, so CR3 is only controllable by the um, the uh, kernel. Um, in a similar, uh, in a similar vein, there's a special register called MSR LSTAR. It's a model-specific register, long-mode syscall target address register. This is the address. Uh, this is the uh, register that defines where the syscall instruction transfers control flow to, right? Usually, that's inside the kernel. Obviously, if you could set that, then you could intercept all uh, sorts. You could wreak a lot of havoc for a lot of reasons that we'll go into uh, later. And uh, there are um, two instructions, uh, write MSR and read MSR, that are used to uh, mess with this register. And of course, these instructions are also um, reserved only for kernel use. Um, so uh, now we've established this kind of dichotomy, right? Where um, you have the kernel, you have um, user space, and uh, the two are, are not equivalent. 
Um, so, uh, let me adjust volume. I just now notice it's getting a little crazy. Okay. So, um, how does your computer know if you are allowed to uh, run, you know, if you're allowed to touch the CR3 register or not? If you do move CR3 RAX, how does it know whether to let you do that? Um, the CPU, as it's executing, tracks the privilege level at which you're currently executing. And this uh, privilege level is split into rings. This is, uh, again, a, an, an x86 centric view of things. Um, there are architectures with uh, many rings. There are architectures that don't use the terminology of rings. Um, there are architectures with only two rings. Realistically, uh, in x86, you only kind of use two and a half rings. I'll go into the half um, next. But um, historically, there have been these four rings. Ring zero, um, actually, let's start from user space, which we are familiar with. Uh, ring three, the outermost ring, the least privileged ring. We've been living in this ring throughout this entire course. Um, it's very restrictive. You can't do stuff like set the CR3 register. You uh, uh, can't interact with um, hardware peripherals. You can't do halt. You, there's many, many things you're not allowed to do. Uh, but, you know, that's still enough to run Google Chrome. And, and and other you know advanced um, uh, Counter Strike and, and and so forth. Very cool advanced software. And of course, when this uh, software running in this ring needs to do anything in terms of interacting with the system, it needs to talk to Ring One. There is um, Ring Two and Ring One. Or sorry, it has to talk to Ring Zero. So there's Ring Two and Ring One. They um, were originally envisioned for device drivers of different, uh, you know, access levels. Uh, you know, maybe you wanted some uh, piece of code that had access to the in and out instruction, but didn't have access to the CR3 register, right? Um, realistically, they're not used. Um, we, we are not actually that serious about security to actually utilize these um but they exist and i'll actually uh talk briefly about a uh, use case for ring one for example next and then you have ring zero this is called supervisor mode it's unrestricted you can do anything uh you could do stuff that will directly harm your hardware you could lock um your cpu's um uh, uh, uh what's it called your CPU clock uh, to be very high, disable uh, thermal uh, throttling, and you could shut down fans depending on how fancy your motherboard is, and you could burn out your CPU if you really wanted to in ring zero, right? Um, again, depending on hardware, depending on driver support, etc. But but you can do a lot. Um, you can be very dangerous. You can certainly destroy the system, uh, whether permanently or temporarily. Um, and uh, Realistically, normally, this is where your kernel runs and does not destroy your system. Normally, it is uh, it manages a peaceful cohabitation of a bunch of uh, modules, a bunch of um, your user space processes, um, and all the resources that they use. And similar to an operating system uh, tracking your user ID, and throughout this course, you're uh, you know constantly concerned with am I running as root? What's my effective ID? What's my real ID? You know, with the set UID challenges you've been solving. Um, similar to that, the CPU tracks your current privilege level. It says, okay, what ring am I in right now? In user space, you're in ring three. In um, a kernel mode, you're in ring um, uh, uh, zero, obviously, and so on. So let's talk briefly about um, these rings. Actually, we, we go uh, now beyond ring zero. There's actually a ring negative one, and I'll explain why. Um, the limitations of just having a ring zero, and that's where the kernel lives, and the kernel uh, is the end all be all um, super authority of the system, um, started showing its cracks in the early 2000s with the rise of virtual machines, right? A virtual machine is a um, basically a guest system you run inside your computer. Uh, for example, if you're running Linux and you want the Windows machine, or if you're running Windows and you want the Linux machine, um, or or whatever, um, or if you are a cloud compute provider and you want to rent out virtual machines to people, you basically um, have a uh, server or workstation on which you have an operating system that is the host operating system. And inside that, in virtual machines, run different guest operating systems that you can grant access to. These guest operating systems um, should uh, 
not have unlimited access to your hardware, right? This uh, makes sense. Uh, if they had unlimited access to your hardware, um, they could, uh, if, if they had true ring zero access, they could shut down your machine. They could do a lot of stuff that you don't want a guest operating system, a guest virtual machine doing to your host um, system. So the solution in the early 2000s when virtual machines first came about, and this is um, uh, kind of when, when you know, the, the first version of VMware and, and so forth came about was to uh, virtualize um, in this interesting way by forcing the guest kernel into ring one, right? And the guest kernel would run in ring one and many, many things would actually work and it could switch into ring three and ring three could switch back and so forth. But when it would switch into, um, um, when it was trying to do a functionality that relied on ring zero access, things would go haywire because it's not running in ring zero. The CPU would refuse to run that and it would crash, right? So then all of these costly and complex, uh, basically software emulation methods needed to be used to simulate ring zero functionality inside the guest OS. This uh, had a lot of performance overhead and, and just a lot of complexity. So a modern solution was invented. So we have the super uh, uh, supervisor mode, um, which is what the kernel runs. This is ring zero. We have now as a society uh, invented hypervisor mode. This runs uh, basically under ring zero um, uh, and is able to intercept uh, certain sensitive actions without having to do software emulation stuff purely in hardware um, and handle them in the host OS. So stuff like, you know, simulated uh, virtual hardware access in the virtual machine um, and so on. Um, so this is uh, what has actually enabled uh, the modern... Um, Kind of cloud compute uh, paradigm. Um, this hypervisor mode in um, hardware using stuff like Intel's uh, VTX uh, uh, virtual technology extensions, maybe, and so on. Um, we're not going to talk about hypervisors in uh, this module for sure, um, but it's just something that you should be aware is there. So um, what does this have to do with modern operating systems, right? Um, it has a lot to do with modern operating systems. Obviously, this is how modern operating systems work. Um, but the way that they use these ring uh, system, uh, this, this, this uh, kind of ring paradigm and so forth is uh, different, right? So there are different types of um, kind of operating system genres. And it basically depends um, on how the uh, kernel, the very core of the operating system, interacts with its drivers and interacts with user space programs. Excuse me, the typical um, system that uh, we are dealing with in this course, of course, is Linux. Um, Linux and things like FreeBSD and so forth, they're monolithic kernels. There's a single kernel binary that runs in um, ring zero that handles all OS level tasks. And when you have a driver for a, a, a um, graphics card, for a sound card, for a file system, typically these are loaded as modules inside your kernel, um, uh, running with the, the, the same, you know, inside ring zero. There's a, another type of operating system called a microkernel. A microkernel, uh, which is mostly used either in security critical uh, situations such as SEL4 or in um, toy kernels such as Minix, the ancestor of Linux. Um, a microkernel has a, a tiny core that runs in ring zero, and it's the only thing that runs in ring zero. Everything else, drivers, um, user space programs, and so forth, they run in uh, less privileged rings. Uh, depending on the flavor, it can be either just everything runs in ring three. And when they need to do something like talk to the hardware, they will actually query ring, uh, the kernel running in ring zero and ask it to talk to the hardware on their behalf. Um, this is only used really in, in niche situations because it's slow. All of this communication 
between rings, communication between different components, uh, the fact that a driver has to dispatch um, hardware interactions to the kernel instead of being part of the kernel and able to perform hardware interactions on its own um, has fairly high uh, runtime overhead. And so it's typically not used. And then there's something uh, slightly in between. There's a, a hybrid kernel where there are some microkernel features where some OS functionality really does live in user space. And then for performance reasons or compatibility reasons or, or, or a mix of those, um, there's a monolithic kernel component that lives in uh, kernel space. For example, uh, Mac OS is a hybrid system of this kind of Unix core basically based on BSD with a whole bunch of Apple extensions. You, you can view this as a hybrid kernel where that core is a monolithic kernel and the extensions are uh, have a bit of a microkernel flavor. Windows is, uh, or modern Windows is similar. Um, if you have uh, done a lot of kind of in-depth uh, power user type stuff in Windows, you might have seen uh, uh, kernel uh, 32.dll, probably now kernel 64.dll. I don't know, I don't really use um, 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 uh, Windows uh, regularly and versus NTDLL, right? Um, and, and, and those are kind of the, 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 the micro kernel components and then that, that live inside your user, uh, inside user space. And then there's a, a core that runs in, uh, a very large core, larger than a micro kernel that runs in ring zero. Um, the point is, though, um, for most intents and purposes, Linux and even the like many interesting parts of Windows and Mac OS have a monolithic kernel uh, flavor um, or just basically are a monolithic kernel. And in a monolithic kernel, everything that is related to the kernel, all these drivers and everything are the kernel. Um, why is this relevant? Well, this is relevant as we'll see because that means that any vulnerabilities in a device driver in a monolithic kernel um, is a kernel vul vulnerability. If you exploit that, you have complete control of the system. All right, so let's see, uh, you know, when things aren't going wrong, how do you uh, switch between these rings, let's say in, in, in Linux or in, uh, on, on x86? It's, and it's different for every architecture. Um, I, I'm talking specifically about x86-64, MD64 architecture. Um, let's have a, a high level overview. Um, basically your kernel boots in ring zero, right? In supervisor mode. Um, as it boots, it sets that MSR L star register that we had talked about to point to a routine in the kernel. And we actually watch um, uh, some of this, uh, look at some of this in, in the next video. Um, it, it will set MSRL star to point to a routine that is basically called enter syscall, right? That will handle the syscall. When a user space process wants to interact with a kernel, it calls syscall. You have done this a million times, right? What happens when you call syscall? Well, one thing that happens is your privilege level of your process switches to ring zero, right? Um, another thing that happens is control flow jumps to uh, the value in MSR L star to the entry point of the, the syscall handler in the kernel. Now um, you are uh, used to just calling syscall and things magically happen. But you know, under the hood, it's just another call. It's just, it is a call that's a little special. Um, the third thing it does is it saves the return address into the uh, register RCX rather than putting it uh, on the stack. Why is this? Well, because the stack is um, kind of untrusted. You could have another thread that is at the same time uh, messing with the stack in some uh, not good way and, and, and uh, you know, causing big issues. So you put the return address into RCX. And that's it. I mean, it does a couple of other housekeeping tasks that I'm sure are very important. And, and you can actually um, follow this link um, to get the uh, pseudocode of the um, syscall instruction. Actually, maybe we should follow the link. Um, let me switch over to a browser. Uh, if we zoom in here, this is the uh, pseudocode of these, uh, um, 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 of the syscall instruction. And you can see what it does is it 
puts uh, the return address into our CX, jumps um, uh, to this uh, L star, um, the, the, the address in the L star register, and then it has um, somewhere here, here maybe, um, it, it, it sets the, uh, uh, yeah, the, the privilege level to zero sets it to ring zero. So that's just an, an internal um, thing that's tracked. Super straightforward, right? Um, and in the, this enables all of you know modern uh, multi-process computing and so forth. Knowing this, you can almost, I mean, obviously there's a lot to go, but you can almost uh, implement your own operating system, right? You just, you know, do this. All right, anyways, when the uh, kernel is ready to return to user space, it calls the appropriate return uh, instruction. So if it was uh, invoked using syscall, it will call sysret. Sysret does what syscall does in reverse. It um, switches the privilege level to ring three, and then it jumps to RCX. And again, you can follow, um, you know, over here in this site, it also has the sysret um, pseudocode, and you can see it does a lot of other uh, important stuff, but that's basically it. Um, it's actually quite straightforward. Um, all right, let's talk real quick about the um, kernel user relationship. Um, basically, uh, user space processes have a virtual memory at low addresses, right? Um, this might be hard to see depending on the size of the screen, but but you're used to um, you know doing cat proc self um, uh, maps, right? The, the, the memory space mappings. Um, basically, they are, all of these addresses start with two null bytes. And then there is, you know, uh, 7F, blah, 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 and lower. Um, everything higher than that is kernel memory. And you typically don't see kernel memory with the sole exception of this vsyscall um, uh, page that's mapped. I'll briefly mention, well, I'll mention right now, it's basically a um, obsolete um, optimization for making syscalls faster um, that is, is used less and less uh, nowadays. Um, but this is a kernel page that is accessible to user space, basically, which is kind of crazy. But basically, the kernel has its own virtual memory space adjacent to your process virtual memory space. I mean, it's the same virtual memory space, but the kernel has um, the high... Uh, it, the kernel has its data and code and so forth in high addresses. Um, interestingly, system calls that like the sys construction doesn't switch the virtual memory mapping or anything. It all it does is it switches into ring zero and then jumps to an instruction. But normally, kernel memory is not accessible from ring three, so you can't just guess at that address and jump there um, without being allowed to do so by uh, by by uh, elevating into ring zero by, for example, doing a syscall. Um, so that's how um, the kernel works at a very, very, very high level. Of course, we'll delve into it a little more in the future videos, obviously. Um, let's talk real quick about security of the kernel. This is a security course, and we'll be exploring kernel vulnerabilities, um, if not right this moment, right now, um, I just want you to become familiar with the kernel and familiar with interacting and, 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 and debugging that this environment and so forth. Um, but eventually we'll be exploiting vulnerabilities in the kernel. So what kind of vulnerabilities are in the kernel? Well, they're the standard, many, many of the standard vulnerabilities that we have um, talked about and will talk about in this course. Code in the kernel is just code. It's just running in a higher privilege level. Similar to exploiting a set UID executable, you are exploiting the ultimate set UID, the ultimately privileged executable um, through very specific um, communication channels, right? That we'll talk about um, soon. All right, so uh, why might you want to um, and how would you exploit the kernel? Well, you can attack the kernel from a number of directions. Um, there have been attacks of vulnerabilities in the past that were triggerable from the outside world. Back, uh, this is kind of more in the domain of the 90s, but it's popped up here and there since then, where you could craft a um, 
carefully created malicious uh, network packet, send it at a machine, and the machine would crash or you would uh, gain code execution. This happened a lot in Windows 95. Um, it has happened in Linux. It's very rare, especially rare nowadays. Um, you can imagine how something like this might be um, extremely, extremely um, terrifying in the modern world. Of course, you can launch um, your attacks from user space. And this is how we will be launching our attacks um, in, um, or, or launching our interactions by, um, you know, exploiting vulnerabilities in syscall handlers, um, I will call, and, and, and other um, kernel interfaces uh, that we'll talk about. Um, this is a very large way of, um, a very common way that people escape from sandboxed processes. In the sandboxing module, I had linked to a, um, a, a repository of vulnerabilities, uh, sandbox escape vulnerabilities. The majority of them, or very, very many of them, actually exploit a, um, a use an attack vector from the sandbox into a kernel uh, interface that is allowed by the sandbox for performance reasons and exploit a vulnerability in the kernel interface. Um, and an interesting attack vector is uh, launching exploits from devices that you plug in. So there have been many examples of uh, systems that are that that don't handle peripheral peripherals properly. That's also just an exchange of bits, right? So you can buy a device, a programmable USB stick like the TNZ, for example, program it carefully with an attack, plug it into some um, embedded device and achieve code execution. It's very cool. Um, what do you want to do with an attack, right? Um, if you're launching it from the outside, actually, you might want to achieve persistence on the box. You might want to achieve a presence, right? You plug in a Teensy and suddenly you have code execution running on uh, your game console or something, right? Um, if you are launching it from user space, you typically either want to escalate your privileges or you want to install a rootkit in the system to kind of hide um, some uh, maliciousness inside the kernel. Um, or hide it from other processes. Um, or um, you might want to use the kernel and its unfettered access to the hardware to go further. So I'll leave you with one example of this. In 2016, a uh, security researcher um, calling himself Mike Pizza used a crazy chain of exploits on a Huawei P9 phone, a very uh, you know modern phone at the time, um, started with a um, normal Android application installed through normal methods. That application exploited a vulnerability in a system uh, process on the Huawei P9 to achieve root access. From there, um, the uh, application now having root access had uh, more or less unfettered access into the kernel. It could make arbitrary system calls and so forth. And uh, Mike Pizza used that uh, capability to uh, exploit a kernel vulnerability to gain code execution inside the kernel, used that execution, um, that presence inside the kernel to attack a um, uh, an application running on an attached security device trust zone, a separate processor uh, running attached to the uh, processor um, uh, typically present on your phone. The trust zone handles things like fingerprint authentication, which then uh, Mike Pizza attacked by um, uh, compromising the trust zone kernel and being able to, using that trust zone kernel, modify the actual fingerprint module um, to uh, allow him to unlock a phone just by pressing his nose against the fingerprint sensor. This is a very crazy stuff involving basically two kernel uh, vulnerabilities and two uh, uh, application vulnerabilities. One application vulnerability to get root access in the Android uh, uh, device, then a kernel vulnerability to get into the kernel, then a vulnerability to get into the trust zone um, user space, and then into the trust zone kernel, and from that trust zone kernel into another trust zone application. This is the kind of thing that um, we are now opening up Two, this is the world of truly flowing all throughout a computer system and getting everything you can out of the vulnerabilities present. See you in future.
uh, videos.